As an introduction, I'll take words from Dr. Bouchard's Twitter feed, seeing as these are the words on that platform uh, that made me get in touch with her in the first place. Support indigenous communities to have their own healthcare system. You cannot decolonize colonial systems. Support indigenous physicians to lead the way. Allow them to be visible. Stop forcing indigenous physicians into a violent system. Or perhaps this other tweet from her. Today on Red Dress Day, I will give a presentation to Ontario's doctors, providing insight into my experience as an indigenous physician working in community. I remember my female patients today who have passed away as a direct result of medical negligence or anti-indigenous racism by health care providers. Another tweet that she has shared on her feed includes the words, Yet another indigenous woman disposed of in a landfill. Or another retweet. As the threats of climate change intensify, research confirms lands managed by indigenous peoples are healthier and more vibrant. I cannot introduce Dr. Boschard any better than she can. I thank you for your time, Doctor. Enjoy. The podcast from Guana Mank is. I think it's really cool, and um, that is what I wanted to say. Two and a mic. Two. Two. I'm very excited to be joined by Dr. Beauchart from Canada, unless I'm mistaken. Hello, Dr. Samantha Beauchart. Bonjour, which is hello in in Anishinaabe Moen. Uh, Hi, everybody. (laughs) Yeah, you are um, one of the few remaining, uh, I suppose, in some ways, positive elements of the platform Twitter in the sense that it's still possible to connect with interesting people on there, isn't it? I certainly do uh, agree with that. That is why I remain on the platform. It's, uh, you know, I, I like it. So I'm going to I'm going to stay up there. It's a good way to stay politically connected and see what's going on, especially in my profession uh, in healthcare. So. Yeah, and that's what that's what drew me to you, because you I, I remember reading this very powerful tweet, um, which was specifically about uh, health care in relation to First Nations people. And I thought, OK, wow, this is a voice which I've really been looking for actively uh, to hear more about. And and there you were. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I'm, I, I can't wait to get more details about it. So would you like to tell us a bit about what you do and um yeah what you represent sure so who am i so you know my english name is samantha beauchart given to me by my obviously by my parents i come from uh two very different worlds so my father his ancestors uh came over to canada from germany in like the you know mid 1800s and my mother is uh, First Nations, or as we would call ourselves, Anishinaabe, or the original people of Turtle Island, which is what we call Canada, or North America. Um, so, you know, through the marrying of two very different um, ancestries and, and cultures and worldviews came, came me. <laughs> um, and I grew up... Uh, so so my 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 mother unfortunately is very much a product of uh, the colonization and the cultural genocide of her people so she um, you know married my father and sort of disappeared into the general canadian society and presented herself just as a settler or a white woman because she was what we call white passing she was very light skinned um So she could kind of get away with not being identified as Indigenous, and she was happy to do that. Um, Because I think she had a lot of shame around, that was built into her from a young age, because 
she attended one of those schools we call a residential school where the goal of the school was to you know remove the indian or the culture from the child and, and tell them they were less than and that uh you know they should basically be ashamed of who they were and, and, and you know the the structures as they are were were successful in, in in weeding that out of my mother and you know i understand now what she, i didn't know at the time right um what she had been through she's now she's now gone on to spirit world but she it wasn't until i was in my teens that i um, i've always been very curious so asking a lot of questions about who i am and why things are the way they are with one family versus the other family and what's a reservation and what is i just started asking question after question and then you know all of this sort of unraveled for me over the last um you know 25 years um and now what do i do I, I, like being a curious person i i love a uh, human the human condition, human physiology. I became a physician, family doctor. I'm really interested in understanding who we are as human beings and helping us heal uh, mentally, spiritually, physically, emotionally. Uh, so that is what I do now. I'm a mother. I have a nine-year-old daughter and um, I have a German shepherd who tries my patience every day. <laughs> and you know, the goal of being a physician in my mind was always to come back to my the First Nations community where I am, you know, where my ancestors, where my relatives are and, and help in that healing process. Uh, but that's more difficult than one might think, <laughs> you know, because um, the education systems, the st health structures as they exist were not built in order to support the healing of our people you know there were never supposed to be doctors that were indigenous <laughs> um so now that there are starting to be uh, we we have a hard time finding a place in which we can operate in a way that makes sense for us so i did work in the healthcare system for seven years within first nations communities but under organizations that themselves were not led by indigenous people, their, you know, colonial health systems. Um, and, and that was just, you know, soul sucking for me. <laughs> so I, I learned as much as I could about the needs of the people, but uh, I recently left that system. And now I'm in this creative space of trying to basically start a new healthcare model that makes sense for indigenous people that's delivered by indigenous people <laughs> yeah yeah, I, I mean, that so many important elements that you've introduced in in, in those few uh, sort of short short lines. Just if if it's possible, if you permit me to ask a personal question. Um, so you, in your teens, so around the age of seventeen, uh, was your mother still alive at this time? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, how hard was it for her to watch you? go into this journey of discovery of a culture she had essentially been forced to ignore? Um, her and I butt heads. She could not understand why I would want to reconnect that way. It, it, and so she really, really did not like that I was searching in that little going down that rabbit hole. She felt like it would be too difficult of a, she didn't want me to face all of the negativity. If I started identifying as an indigenous person, I think she just wanted me to be protected. And she knew that if I started looking and started reconnecting, that along with that would come all of these barriers and all of this you know the ongoing uh, genocide that exists or the ongoing struggles so so I, now that i look back at it i understand why she was so you know because mothers just want us to have an easy time in life and i think she just wanted me to leave it alone and just you know get my education just work in the general community and just you know be happy 
she didn't want me to go down a rabbit hole that would be politically difficult, emotionally difficult. Um, and I get that. So we did butt heads uh, most of her life until she she passed away about, uh, I want to say six years ago from um, a stage four colon cancer. And, you know, that's another disease process which tends to present very late in Indigenous people and more often. Um, and there's many reasons for that, but uh, unfortunate, definitely unfortunate. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, it, it's suggestive, is it not, that she was very much aware of this ongoing prejudice within the system, within society. So it seems not necessarily that perhaps she had completely closed the door on that side of things, but she wanted really, as you say, to protect you from that prejudice. Um, yeah, and she also had like her own internalized racism. So she even spoke very poorly of her community and her family like it's like they really turned her against herself internally so there was those two elements you know she mm. she was turned against herself but she was also well aware of that struggle and she didn't want me to have to face any of that so mm. But this is quite an interesting phenomenon because I've I've also identified this among uh, immigrants in a certain country. Um, once they have become established within a new host country, they turn around and are more against new immigration than the people who are actually also born in that host yeah. country. It's it's crazy, isn't it? A human mentality in these things. Yes, I think that in order to be safe and accepted, we do go to great lengths, right? To, against our own identities, right? Just to, just to be able to feel safe and secure. And I, I mean, I don't, my mother was very quiet, did not speak about her experiences very much when she was young. Um, she would only give us little bits and pieces about, um, you know, being fed or being provided, you know, pills or these treats that reminded her of dog biscuits at school, you know, and, and we think about those nutritional experiments and, um, you know, the testing of, of drugs on Indigenous kids in schools that, you know, and she, but she didn't talk a lot about it. It was very quiet. In fact, she didn't acknowledge it as even um, I, like I never heard her say I went to a residential school. It wasn't until after she passed away and all of the settle, there was set, a lot of settlements going on for kids who attended these schools and she was on the list of attendees and I was like, oh, now it makes sense, these stories she would tell me. Yeah, I, I do recall with horror uh, a few years ago when some of the absolute uh, the unbelievable tragedies were revealed with some of the uh, these mass graveyards uh, from former residential schools and um i think at the time they also cancelled canada day if i'm not mistaken because of the the sheer uproar i mean i'm sure these are stories though that the the first nations community was has always been aware of as in, it's impossible for any community's children to be taken away from them for them to disappear and then that that be forgotten about um uh, what was the response though from the first nations people to this uh to the media uproar um is was it like confirmation that uh, you know this is what we've been saying for years and why has it taken you so long to open your eyes to your own history um like i, I can't obviously i can't speak for everyone and for everyone listening i only speak for myself uh in my own experience and uh like, obviously, I think it opened up a lot of grief when that happened. Like, we, our own families, our own nations, we know the stories. We are well aware that a lot of our family members went missing, were never heard from again. You know, these are things that we just know because it's, how do you not know? It's in your own family. Um, it wasn't spoken of very often until, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada did their interviews across the country with families it wasn't 
you know, that's when the stories really started to have a voice within families. So, you know, when when these, you know, graves or sites were found, it was just, for me personally, it, it just triggered a lot of grief again. Um, but, you know, there was some, and for me, it was, it was a moment of, I hope that this helps people understand how, you know, historical things continue to affect us today. And, um, you know, but now there's all this denialism happening. Um, and we see it on Twitter a lot, actually, uh, you know, de denialism about, about the children actually being, you know, killed or that that's not really graves or whatever there's all this what that like that we're just trying to get sympathy as a community and uh you know it's the farthest thing from the truth uh, we we have been made to be dependent on government we don't want to be dependent we want to heal we don't want anything we just want to be able to you know have the basics of what we need be able to exist in a safe space like you know like everyone just wants peace and harmony right yeah yeah um i, I mean what you say obviously continues to be um uh, relevant in in many cultures it's for us in, in europe um it's we hear a lot more about us politics than we do about canadian politics and obviously the with the woke act which um yeah the republicans have been producing and then yeah, the, some of the elements within this act where they want to uh, essentially um deny any opportunity to talk about topics which could be in some ways what they've described as politically divisive but what they really mean is they want to cover up uh the you know the, the horrors uh, of the formulation of the united states um so these denialists obviously stem from this this kind of uh, political uh, spectrum. Um, there are also uh, Holocaust deniers um, for other events, tragic events uh, in history as well. Um, how how prominent are these kinds of uh, yeah uh, deniers is one word. Um, you know, ignorant bastards is another term that we <laughs> use. But um, how prominent are these people in Canadian politics? they're definitely present i i don't know how you know i don't i can't give you like a number but i do have a theory and it's you know just like there are the victims of genocide there are the perpetrators right and those perpetrators have instant when i say ancestors i mean both forward and backward in time right um so those those people who perpetrated this have lineages yeah. now and those people they might not even know where all of their anger is coming from but like you know sometimes i think these denialists might be descendants of the people who perpetrated this and they're carrying all of that and the only thing they know how to do is continue to live in denial and and that's like that's that's something we're not talking about you know because i'm the i am the descendant of the of the families who are perpetrated against and i carry all of that and so the people who actually committed this their just dis, their descendants carry epigenetically that guilt and that shame and that you know and then and then maybe that's where denialism is you know i don't know this is just my <laughs> Well, no, but I mean, because it's, it's not just families, is it? It's we're talking about political classes. We're talking about yeah, yes, uh, cor yes. corporations. Yes. So clearly, they use denial as a, a as a vehicle to justify their their status and place yeah. in society today. Yeah. It's uh, unfortunately, it's it's um, every story in itself is obviously unique. Um, but these classes exist in a variety of places, and for some reason, they maintain uh, political support among. The public who they continue to victimize in a number of different ways yeah i'd like to think that they're the, like you know they're the smaller percentage of the population but i don't know exactly but i would say i i only i only come obviously on twitter if i see denialism or posts i block because i just don't want to see it 
because it's very triggering for me. So I just block it all off my feed. <laughs> um, and then I see less of it, right? So I, so I don't know. True. Yeah, and which is understandable. I mean, there are um, there should be elements of the community in place which are there to fight against these uh, other uh, horrible sides. Uh, it shouldn't. People like yourself shouldn't have to carry that burden the whole time, nor indeed on your own. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I think a lot of people are waking up to the fact that you know. Women need allies. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter needs allies. Indigenous yeah. peoples need allies. Yeah. Uh, Pride, you know, LGBTQ plus people need allies. Everybody needs an ally, um, and I'm happy to be an ally to all of these groups because they are deserving, not because it's a question of popularity. Yeah. Um, and and I think quite a lot of people feel that way as well. So. Yeah, and I'm right there in in that boat with you. I'm so talking about something more positive is the sure. work that, that you are doing. Um, and I, so there's this fantastic article about you that goes back uh, to 2017, where you are the March, April all-star um, <laughs> from this.org. Um, and I'm not sure which fantastic quotation to read of yours. Um, but let's start with okay let's go back to so a tradi providing a traditional holistic treatment is much more successful in its outcome um, and you point out that physical symptoms often stem from underlying emotional challenges um, so you are a physician um, trained in western medicine but on mm -hmm. top of, on top of that you also provide traditional indigenous healing and that has a uh a spiritual element to it as well right so so a little bit of a miscommunication between me and that interviewer but i'll clarify so i'm a fully trained western md family practice um but i my I do not identify as a traditional indigenous healer, <laughs> um, but I utilize traditional indigenous healing practices in my own life. And if I, and I'm able to connect my patients or my clients to those modalities, like via my circle of, you know, of human beings. <laughs> um, that doesn't, you know, but I do have certain gifts, like all human beings, we all come into this, into this place with gifts, spiritual gifts. Um, and, and I do have those gifts, like everyone. But of course, if you if you don't recognize them, and you don't feed them, they do not grow. <laughs> so, um, so I'm still working on those gifts. Uh, but but like, I, I think it's too much to say I'm a healer. But I definitely can recognize, you know, I have certain insights or certain intuitions or certain things that, you know, the Western system would not, you know, would, would not understand. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and certainly in my last 20 years, I've spent a lot of time in ceremony. Um, I've been out fasting on the land and I understand you know, what we call natural law, the natural law of creation, you know, what we need as human beings in order to, to be fully functioning and well <laughs> in relationship to the land, in relationship to each other. Like I'm working on that understanding, but you know, that perspective and how we, I see the world through that lens is just different than, you know, your classically trained family doctor. Um, so my approach to care is rooted in in a more um, holistic way of, of looking at things and doing things. And, you know, the options I'd present to somebody or how I see them would be communicated in a different way. That's all. Um, and, you know, it takes a certain kind of you know, some patients or some clients don't want that kind of care. They just, 
you know, they like the classic MD. They just want to get in, get out, get their script. And that's, that's great, but that's just not how I, you know, I can do that for you because I, I, I value both systems, right? I see their positives and their negatives and we do our best. What I do is I do my best just to provide my knowledge and then people choose for themselves what path they want to follow. So. Mm -hmm. And and when people see you and they see that you are uh, incorporating these traditional healing uh, methods, do you see a certain sense of uh, pleasure uh, that they've found finally found themselves um, in front of somebody who understands them? Do you see that gratification from in their eyes as well? Yeah, certainly in the First Nations community, there's like this big sigh of relief you know that i am i am too from that community it's like they can take off all their fear of being mistreated and they can take off all that fear of being misunderstood and just leave it you know and so there's just you know and, and i spend the time with people i don't rush them in and out you know i ask them about their family and their day and what they're up to and what's happening <laughs> I'm willing to go to their home for a visit. I'm willing to go for a walk if they want. I'm just more fluid and more flexible in my approach. And, 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 and certainly I get, you know, my patients really value that. You know, I, I see the value in, in, you know, encouraging more First Nations youth to, to pick up this career um, because we need more, um, you know, we need more uh, physicians who understand all of those you know, pieces. Yeah. Do you feel, do you feel that your community is very protective of you as a result? Uh, I think we're still at this like early stage of my community. Like they, va I know they value me. They're like, yes, we want you to come provide service for our community. But they're, they're not, they don't have the infrastructure to host me as a physician uh, or the or the funds to pay me a salary uh, right now. So so I've actually had to. I've had to travel quite a bit to just find a space where I could serve indigenous people as a physician. Um, and so right now in this whole year, it's like scrambling, not scrambling, that's a bad word. We're like I know my community values me. Um, they want me to be able to come in and start working, but like, how do we do that? So it makes sense for them and for me is where we're at right now. Um, because, you know, a lot of people make the assumption that our health centers on reserves are fully functional and we have doctors, but we don't. There is no primary care. There's no doctors, there's no active, care it's more prevention education and vaccines um and some diabetes care but not um you know no no blood testing or imaging or you know there's no physicians there never has been so you know they don't have the funding for that and i don't understand the political aspect and how the money flows from the federal government but that's on my agenda as well to try to, I'm actually running for council this year in my community to be on the chief and council so wow. that I can start to understand like how I can be most effective in health um, by understanding that political structure, uh, joining it and, you know, against all of my, you know, I've never really liked to be political. I stayed out of it most of my life, but to be honest, it's like if, if you want to affect real change, you sort of have to um, get involved that way. So. Yeah. Um, I, I know fairness and justice isn't necessarily an automatic part of our society, nor indeed our political reality. But if there were just you know sort of trace amounts of these things, then I would imagine the federal government should be in debt to First Nations people uh, because they have enriched themselves on the land that belonged to uh, your, to your ancestors essentially mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so uh, how they can justify not 
transferring necessary budgets to healthcare and social services and education and and all of the other necessary elements that create a modern society uh, i think it's difficult to understand yeah i mean in my mind and i know this is negative but um i think that they could easily be you know change a lot very quickly but um and, and this is sort of like a, a challenging thing to say but part of me feels like they really do want to continue to keep us oppressed um yeah because I, yeah i don't know it's just very strange for me now you know not clinically working this year and and talking to the head of the provincial healthcare system in a meeting you know talking to the head of all these healthcare bodies saying hey i'm here I want to work in my community. I want to be on the ground seeing people. Um, but I don't have the resources to do that. So I'm not doing anything right now. <laughs> you know, and I've said that to people that are getting tons of grant money and tons of funding and checking their indigenous consultation box. But, but I ha you know, it's been six months and I'm still <laughs> just like, okay, you know, there's nothing really happening. So it seems like such a trivial small thing to maybe get a little trailer that i could pull around with my car have a little mobile and i can certainly do this all on my own um but i'm always going to ask for help right because <laughs> that's for the last i'm done doing it on my own so i want to you know keep i'll keep saying it and i know it will come eventually but you know, they've really got to be willing to just hand over the resources and not and not dictate how it's used. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I mean, clearly, it's not even a question of trust because you're somebody who uh, you have quite a public profile. They can see who you are. You're not hiding anything. It's all out in the open. Um, and yet they continue to yeah, resist for who knows what. So I, I can understand why you have this this thought in your mind, and to be honest, it, you know, if it's uh, you know, if it looks like a spade, then it probably uh, yeah, you know, it is a spade, isn't it? Yes, there's still benefit to keeping us oppressed, right? Because if Canada allowed us to become well and live in our gifts, we would have, you know, then we would have all these young, powerful people who know their rights. <laughs> And would be asserting them you know and, and canada would have to fundamentally change and, and i don't we're not there yet no unfortunately not and um indeed as they continue to generate oil and uh other uh well projects uh, which yes. fund their lifestyles then unfortunately it's it's going to continue in this way isn't it yes it is all about resources at the end of the day and we are the we are the protectors of the resources and so they can't have us being strong stronger they they like to keep us you know keep all of our that's how i see it it's sad to say but um you know the more young we call them our warriors our young people you know if they're struggling with all of these things they can't be on those front lines and pushing political agendas and Anyway, I'd mm. like to say it's, it is shifting, but I just wish it was faster. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there are messages coming out. There are um, this, this general development, um, but you can still see political forces resisting really openly as well. I yeah. mean, this is, this is why they've turned the word woke into a kind of a weapon. Um, yeah. When, you know, how can looking after, how can being aware of the suffering of specific communities in any way be threatening uh, to power structures that have been established for hundreds of years? I don't understand. And yet, there you are. They, they, they have managed to weaponize a word for awareness it's uh it, it's yeah it uh it staggers really in many ways um 
you will also have, I'm reading here again, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boshart traveled to North Dakota to join the Dakota Access Pipeline protest. Mm -hmm. um, so you obviously are um, very interested in environmental issues. You said before you mentioned natural law. So this is also a belief structure within First Nations people. Um, and yeah, I suppose Western scientists are catching on to this much later than uh, your elders have been aware of these issues. Um, yes. Yeah, how do you feel about this? Okay, climate change, I could imagine how you feel about it, but how do you feel about the, the shift, as it were, of other uh, communities? Do you see people finally waking up uh, to this reality or, or, or not? It depends on the individual, but you have to be connected. You have to actually be connected to the environment to understand its effect on you as a human being. So if you, if we continue to live disconnected, then I fear that those people will never really understand, but you know, if if they're in, if they want to know, they have to. You know, ex you have to be exposed to the environment. You have to, um, you know, wake up with the sun. <laughs> you have to go out on the land. You have to spend time in nature. You know, as women, our cycle, our our menstrual cycle, is very much connected to the moon cycle and to the light cycle and you know, there, even that has been very interrupted, right? Um, and it has become very abnormal or we're regulated with hormones and this and that, but, uh, you know, it's all, <laughs> it's, it's hard to explain until you, until you yourself as a human being become more in tune with those things. Uh, and then, and then I don't, it's, a, it's kind of like a, it's a belief, but it's like a knowing. It's like a, almost like a higher sense, the <laughs> sixth sense or something. Um, and, you know, with the North Dakota access, you know, I don't see the U.S. and Canada from my indigenous lens as two separate places, right? So Turtle Island, it's one whole place. And, you know, it's our responsibility um, to protect the land and the water. And, and so it's not really, you know, spiritually, emotionally, it's not really a choice. It was like that was happening and I was there. <laughs> um, but it was more to participate in the ceremonies that were going on, the prayer, not to stand at the front, you know, and, and be like a ruckus. You know, it was about prayer and, and supporting that community. Um, and uh, and that was motivated not by any it just was something i had to do and i can't really explain it it's like i'm going and i called on i had a two-year-old at the time and I actually found someone just i didn't want to bring her to the front line because i just thought it was too dangerous so um so i just went to participate in prayer and i had a, a wonderful uh colleague and friend his name is dr adrian angles uh, at the time, he was actually just thinking of applying to medical school, but he's he is actually an MD now from Oneida of the of the Thames First Nation. Um, you know, he dropped everything and accompanied me down. We shared the drive, and um, yeah, that's just how we are as a community. You know, we we go. Yeah, and, and quoting you, I sat in a space called the Emotional Wellness TP. Uh, yeah. Can you can you explain this for people who are not necessarily aware? Sure. So my intention going down was actually to just uh, provide medical care, but once I arrived, um, they had this fully functioning holistic health area. So there was the doc, the, the classically trained Western doctors. Um, and there was alternative approaches next to them. And then there was a teepee. Um, and, and, and I just, I don't know, I migrated. That's where I felt like I should be. And it was basically a space where people who were like having needed that emotional, spiritual support 
were struggling with what was happening would just come and share, you know. So so I li I just sat there and was present, listened to people. Um, I was always available to do medical things should they ask me, but um, that's that's where I chose to be was in that space. Uh, and it was just so what a beautiful place that was. That whole place. It's like they they established an entire community <laughs> with every resource. You know, every kind of medicine, every kind of healing, every kind of food, every, you know, it was all there. And I was just like, wow, this is beautiful. <laughs> Look what we can do, right? Look what we can do. <laughs> um, yeah. But I did never go to the front line because uh, I did not want to get injured or, uh, you know, because I had my daughter at home. But I was there during like the height of the, uh, the conflict when they were using, you know, the high power hoses and the rubber bullets, and uh, you know, one of the elders I think had a, had a heart attack that night, you know, just due to the stress, and it was just uh, just an interesting experience. But can you recall some of the the emotions, the sort of community emotions um, of, of the people there, who, you're struggling to defend? uh you know this way of life in, in many ways and uh and yet coming up against this this machine this this of, of in some ways capitalism or corporatism or whatever um what was the emotion going through the whole place i mean within the camp it was it was just so beautifully connected you know every morning there was a community meeting and we would share in like a sharing circle style um it was just so well organized and there was so much hope and that's what i witnessed i witnessed the ceremony you know the traditional people the hope all of the allies from so many different walks of life um the people that i saw like in the healing space that were struggling uh, I'm trying to think specifically what their needs were. You know, I think it was a lot of people who ended up there, um, but like they shouldn't have been there in a way. Like they were, I think they came intentionally thinking they could try to do something, but they were just overwhelmed, mostly non Indigenous people um, who thought that they could help, but then felt very like overwhelmed by the situation and then had some sort of, you know, anxiety or hopelessness or, you know, and in that case, we just, you know, sent them back home, right? <laughs> um, because we need, we needed strong allies that were able to cope. Um, so, so, so I remember that was a lot, people who just couldn't cope and, and certainly we don't, it's okay if they can't, they don't have to be there. So we would support them to get back to the, where they came from uh, is what is some of the things that, that we were doing in there. Yeah. You talk about these circles and it's, uh, yeah, I love the shape of a circle because it suggests equality, that there's no point uh, and so on. Um, and you use the word hope, and and the thought that occurred to me was: Would you describe the natural path of uh, First Nations people one of hope? That it, it, get all things being equal, um, hope is what they would come together to create within these wonderful communities. Yeah, I will say that 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 is true. Whenever I'm with my community, like yesterday was. National Indigenous Peoples Day or the summer solstice. Uh, you know, it was a politically defined holiday, but you know, I joined my community in the city and we had a big celebration, a big gathering, and we had you know lots of allies came and we were able to do a sunrise ceremony and you know spend the whole day just uh, being together in song and dance and sharing and food and you know that that's how we you even when we're not celebrating that's how our communities are and i know from the outside people 
will look into our communities and I'm either, you know, First Nations or urban indigenous communities and they'll think, oh, because of what they see, you know, housing that needs repair and, you know, doesn't look very nice and they don't have what we have, that, that somehow we're not experiencing joy <laughs> or, but, you know, working in the First Nations community, being First Nations, Everyone is content with so little. They don't need all the things. They just need to be able to have safety, you know, water, <laughs> each other, a roof, you know. Can we say that about the general population? No, you know, we can't function without our, all of our gadgets and all of our this and all of our that, you know. It's, those are all conveniences and uh, in general, we're more content with less conveniences um, and, uh, and hope has always been there. And I think that's why we continue, uh, we, we have continued because that, you know, that understanding of natural law and how it really is and how powerful we really are as human beings. Uh, you know, you can't deny that, 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 you know, that is, that gives us hope. <laughs> mm. And those are, those are like all in our teachings and our way of life is that empowerment and that, you know, our, our humanity is, is so powerful as individuals. We have the, and we understand that, you know, so I think that's, that's where I find my hope. Mm. And you mentioned the word disconnected before and disconnectedness um, uh, and also reading about some of the, the the areas that you cover in the healthcare that you seek to provide. Um, you state that uh, usually the root of illness is in the emotional or spiritual realm. Um, does this disconnectedness lend itself to those emotional illnesses? Uh, this uh, you know, the, the physical, but also the psychological, emotional uh, problems that people encounter? Mm. Yes. <laughs> I will say yes. Um, so, well, I like to picture it as a, uh, a circle, right? You know, and at the very center is you, yourself. Uh, you know, and then there's all those aspects of yourself, your phys you know, how you would feel things, how you witness things, the physical experience, um, how you process your emotion, right? Um, how you understand yourself in the context of everything, which I think is more spiritual. Um, if you feel like there's a higher purpose, right? Or your connection to anything outside of yourself. And then, uh, you know, obviously you have your mind and your thoughts and your intellect. Uh, but my experience is in the, in the Western way of operating, how we go through school and we get educated, they just miss out on that, like the emotional, like how to take care of yourself emotionally. And what emotions really are and how they affect our mind you know and our body and how you know that connection to the spirit you know helps manage all of that so that's not part of our formal education in, in this day and age but that was the central of our education um as a, as a culture as an indigenous and that's indigenous cultures across the world not just ours <laughs> Um, so, so therein lies the disconnection, I, I feel like if, if you don't understand all of that, then how are you even connected to yourself? And then, and then how do you understand why your hip is like, you know, really sore all the time? <laughs> uh, like it, I just know it's all connected and, and it has a lot to do with emotions as well as you know physical things of course but we tend to oversimplify in medicine 
but how the uh, how the emotions trigger the release of cortisol or affect the immune system, you know, which then affects your physical being. It's all it's all it's all related, right? Um, yeah, much to ponder. If if I may ask you then one further question. Um, <laughs> And again, I'm referring back to one of your quotations, um, and you, you you alluded to this in certain uh, sentences that you've already spoken. But ultimately, you said, I want to see indigenous people given back the power to take care of each other. Um, and my question is, how far along that path do you think, as a community, you've already traveled? Um, and how far do you yet have to travel before you can say, OK, this is the minimum? that we find acceptable? Hmm. Uh, currently, I would say our communities are still in that healing journey. Um, and so you can't really take care of each other <laughs> until, it, until you have a certain amount of people that can do the caring, right? And as, as care providers and healers, like we need to have done our work before we can uh, help others, right? So I think we're like at this, we're starting to look at how we can heal as a community uh, that takes resources, right? That takes resources that are appropriate, <laughs> uh, like our own ceremony, our own, our own spaces, our own people to foster that. You know, and then, so I say we're early on in that, but but I see it starting. But uh, you know, the the the, the colonization and, and the decimation of our family structures is still pretty recent in history, <laughs> and I think that's what people misunderstand. So, like my mother, you know, was actively part of that, and I'm forty now, and I'm. So, so my generation, at least, is starting to acknowledge and pick that back up. Like, do our healing work and then start to reclaim our own ways. Um, so my daughter, who's nine, she has never, she's, I mean, she's learned her parts of her language. She witnesses ceremony. Uh, she knows the history. Uh, when she's my age, you know, she'll be one of those people that's, you know, hopefully fully healed and, and helping. So, yeah, a couple of generations, I think, that will have, um, they say it will take seven. I don't want to say it takes that long. <laughs> I think we can do it in, in two or three, but, but you know, generations have, you know, in the 70s and the 80s and 90s, a lot of people in my mother's age group were starting this work as well. It's just, mm. it's just been slower to move because of the denialism and the ongoing, you know, sort of rebellion against us. <laughs> Doctor, I would love to follow uh, as much as you would allow your progress through the political machine as well. Um, sure. I, I would love to hear more because the, you know, we've spoken for not even an hour, and um, for me, it's so such a short time. I, I I can't possibly explain how many questions I've written down here that I'd love <laughs> to be able to ask. So, uh, I would love to hear more about um, you know, what you're doing, what your plans are. I'd love to hear more about some of the history, perhaps as well. Sure. Um, you know, I've covered uh, uh, some elements of uh, um, Indigenous people's history uh, in some of my other podcasts, but it's it's not the same uh, when I'm speaking as to have somebody who's actually a part of the culture also representing. Um, uh, you provide the authority to uh, some of the statements that I make, uh, and, and so I welcome any moment that you are willing to offer in the future. I'd love to hear more from you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Like I said, my voice is my tool, right? And I, anytime I'm asked to speak, I always remind the listeners or the, or the audience, you know, not so long ago, Indigenous women would never be allowed 
any sort of platform to be heard. And so I'm always uh, humbled and grateful to be able to be heard, to be able to share my story. You know, stories are how we, how things change, really. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy anytime to revisit. Um, I have to start to campaign for this election. <laughs> I don't know how it will go. You know, there's a lot of, um, my last name is Beauchart. It's a German last name. I did not grow up in my First Nations community. I grew up outside. So I myself can be considered an outsider from my own people. Um, you know, so we do face our own, lat we call that lateral violence, right? So, you know, I don't know how it will go. I don't know if they, if my community wants me to be in this position. Uh, but I'm willing to put myself out there and offer to be in the position. And if they vote me in, great. <laughs> I can start to work in that in that capacity. But in the meantime, I'll continue to, you know, try to get some traction and some some, uh, I guess, tangible way to start practicing again clinically. In a way that makes sense to me, and works for me. <laughs> Which is also fundamental, isn't it? The the uh, satisfaction for the for for yourself uh, yes. that you generate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's so, so much to talk about, but you know, one hour we just scratched the surface. But I'm happy <laughs> yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, though, for your time. You're welcome.